Capital in the Morning with Renee and McBool. We've obviously see, all seen the parades of the cars that are coming out and finally that the police are mobile to a greater extent. Uh, but we've also seen great challenges within the police force. One, um, in no particular order uh, as you emulated it, one is uh, intelligence-based or intelligence-led uh, uh, police response. We've seen a problem with that in the reports that came out in relation to Westgate, and we've seen it again in the problem that came out in relation to Mpeketoni. In fact, Mpeketoni is a particularly sad one because according to reports that are out in the public domain, the police could have reacted and could have stemmed that problem and could have reduced the number of lives, number one. Number two is the issue of prevention. Uh, so intelligence-led uh, prevention of crime as opposed to uh, reaction and investigation. The feel on the ground that the police now are being used largely for investigative and follow-up purposes, but not actually for law enforcement, which is what in effect might very well be creating the sense of insecurity. How do you respond to that? And then we can come back to the um, challenge in the court and the KDF. Let me uh, tell you that um, what you get to hear is a fraction of what really happens. What, it's much what? worse? No, I'm just, I'm just telling you. <laughs> I'm worried. <laughs> what you get to hear is a real fraction of what really happens. If the police or um, the Ministry of Interior were to tell citizens how much the police have accomplished, how much uh, terrorist activity has been um, uh, dealt with that hasn't come to the public. You wouldn't. You would. You would actually be congratulating our security agencies. They have done a fabulous job. What you see, incidences like the one in Capedo, for example, was really an unfortunate incident. It shouldn't have happened. It could have been done better. The same thing with the uh, with the Lamo. But believe you me, so much has been contained because of intelligence, because of the synergy that now exists between all our security agencies, such that what you see is really a fraction of what has been achieved. But let me say this, that is not to say for a moment that such inc incidences, we should have any excuses for such incidences happening. We are continuously upping our game, you know, continuously. And we know there are still gaps in between. But let me tell you, if you see the kind of investment that we have made in this sector, whether it comes with equipment, whether it is the synergy that we are creating, whether it is intelligence that we are assembling and the, and the coordination that is going into all that, let me tell you, for example, the commander in chief Sometimes I call him at 1 a.m. and he's up. It, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a simple game, you know. Yes, we need to up our game. But believe you me, a lot is being done. You also raised the um, uh, issue, rightly so, once again, you obviously have your finger on the pulse, uh, of the uh, deployment of the KDF mm. within, the, within our borders. Um, our, my understanding of the deployment of the KDF, and I am very subject to correction here, is in what are extreme or emergency conditions. We're now seeing them coming out of the barracks a lot more often. They are a standing army trained in the purpose of combat, whereas the police are trained entirely differently and their dealings with civilians are very different. We've seen the complaints um, a couple of years ago in Mount Elgin in that area when the KDF were deployed uh, to go and clean up. We are seeing them again to the extent that local representatives now in uh, Capedo and surrounding areas are now saying the operation to uh, disarm the locals has gone haywire, remove the KDF, remove the police if this is how they are going to operate. Should the KDF and is the KDF equipped, even trained, to deal with civilians and to deal with them in the specific way that the police is mandated to do? Should they not be in the barracks? Again, let me go back, uh, Rene, and say the KDF is a Kenyan asset paid for by the people of Kenya, manned by Kenyans. 
The KDF is trained for the job of military. But our KDF also stands out in serving in many peacekeeping efforts everywhere around the world. Number three, the KDF legally, in accordance with our laws and the Constitution, can be deployed constitutionally to contain situations in our country. And as I said, as a country, when the situation demands, we mobilize every resource that we have because security is a major concern to every Kenyan. And, and therefore, I do not think that we should spare any effort I, and we should spare no resource when the security situation in the country uh, is called to question. I think every resource that is available, mobilized, so long as it is done legally, constitutionally, I think there is every reason why we should do that. There are excesses in every situation. Even when you see the situation in, um, uh, in Capedo, for example, we, and we have, we have taken action. We've said the police, the KDF, must operate within the law. You know, nobody is above the law. Even as they enforce the law, they must operate within the law. And the, um, the excesses that were witnessed are no more. There was, it was just an, a, a, a one-day situation. That has been brought under control. The situation is being managed properly within the precincts of what is allowed in law. And, and I think going forward, there will be extreme situations, um, but but they wouldn't they would they wouldn't be the rule. They will be the exception. Are we going to see arrests, prosecutions, perhaps convictions? Yes, oh, definitely. In fact, uh, the whole the whole problem about insecurity, especially in uh, pastoralist areas, is an is an issue that the president and myself have undertaken that. We must stamp out cattle rustling. That, that, that is one thing we have promised the nation. And believe you me, Rene, that is one thing we want to deliver. We, are, we have a, a huge program to do. Let me just mention three things. One, we have a huge irrigation program for the pastoralist areas. The whole of the Kerio belt, right, from Baringo through Marakwe through... Uh, Pokot all the way to Turkana and of course Samburu that's number one to to be able to give alternative livelihoods <coughs> so that livestock does not become the alpha and omega the beginning and the end of somebody's life number two with the rollout of devolution there is more resources now for those areas to develop their infrastructure develop their um, alternative livelihoods and as government as, as, as national government we are also rolling out a huge program to um, create infrastructure roads especially in, in those areas and number three we are planning to with development partners uh, again and we want to be uh, very forthright here they are, they've really been helpful that we want to develop more schools in fact we are looking at uh, schools that can, can take 3,400, 3,000, 4,000 kids from all communities so that they can, they can stay together, have irrigation, provide food, make sure that we create a new generation of people from those regions that actually are focused on education. And lastly, for the whole of that region, provide enough men and women to provide security. 